it's five past. Um, thanks, yep. everybody, for logging in. Um, thanks in advance, Mark, for your time and commitment to uh, our industry, which is um, now being called the personal industry, personal, I'll put my teeth back in, personal industry, industry, um, officially by the New South Wales government, uh, off the back of the uh, personal injury commission in New South Wales, taking over a lot of responsibilities from CIRA um, in relation to the uh, policy uh, adoption and um, oversight of the workers' compensation and motor vehicle accident schemes. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying thank you, Mark, for putting the presentation together today and taking time out of your day um, to assist with the education, uh, the ongoing education of all the um, industry stakeholders in our personal industry, personal inju injury industry. Not enough coffee today. Um, prior to Mark's presentation, Lachlan from Insurance and Compensation Services uh, will do a quick overview of some of the exciting and innovative uh, AI um, projects and um, software solutions that uh, he has for our industry. So Locke, um, quick over to you. Um, and I will do the screen share, which you always ask me to do and I forget. Uh, what have I done now? No, you've put yourself on screen sharing, Mark. Yeah. That's fine. Off and multiple screen shares. There we go. All good. Um, you're in the driver's seat, Lock. Over to you, okay. mate. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, insurance and compensation services, we deliver a range of software solutions to the in insurance and personal injury industry. Uh, and one of the uh, products or features that I want to highlight today is our range of artificial intelligence and machine learning products, which we're developing for stakeholders to assist essentially with the goal of the personal, personal injury industry, which is getting people back to work and getting people healthy again. So uh, our, uh, one of our, I guess our key of our flagship AI man, machine learning solution is around medical billing and invoice approval, um, especially for uh, surg surgery requests in compensation schemes. And it's a critical issue for both insurance agencies and specialists. Um, you know, based off some civil reports, some recent judgments by APRA, it highlights the need for uh, significant or support for specialists to have to bill correctly in, in these convoluted and complicated compensation schemes. Um, so we've developed a dual use uh, artificial intelligence tool to assist specialists to check their surgery quotes uh, prior to sending those to the insurers. And on the other hand, to, uh, to assist or to provide support for insurers to uh, accept those invoices within a shorter time frame and, and verify that the AMA codes and the, the step down rules based on the jurisdiction or all, all those have been applied correctly. Um, so in our work with insurance agencies with this tool, we've found that it increases compliance, uh, decreases the time required for the approval, which means that the surgery happens faster, there's less back and forth, the person gets uh, I guess the treatment they require in a faster or a quicker fashion, uh, and it improves the treatment quote validation for specialists and insurers. So that's one our flagship, uh, I guess, AI solution in terms of the uh, surgery quote process for compensation schemes. One of the other pieces that we're working on is an AI trend analysis for law firms. Um, and this, uh, uh, the platform provides law firms with a data-rich trend analysis of injury history and compensation over time. And so our machine learning team have identified key data points uh, which link injury trends to compensation and impairment in various jurisdictions. And this analysis uh, takes signif significant volumes of data and condenses it into key takeaways. And so what this does is this trend analysis can assist lawyers in making compensation and case decisions and it can provide a critical contextual background for settlement discussions uh, to assist the correct decision to be made. Now, in addition to our AI and machine learning work, we are a software provider first and foremost. Um, so we provide a, uh, a range of software solutions for different stakeholders. For example, our ICS Law Connect platform, uh, which is a fully customizable 
uh, platform to assist law firms in their information gathering process. It provides modular service-based offerings and jurisdiction-specific communications and reminders and in assists law firms in increasing their file velocity and decreasing their cost per file. Our ICS Insure Connect is our class-leading insurance software, um, and it's designed to assist insurers in improving return to work outcomes and increasing those work efficiencies. Um, it includes a full workflow and correspondence management and an integrated telehealth solution uh, to assist insurers to connect and engage with the injured party in a more efficient and a more effective fashion. Our final software solution is uh, GovConnect. GovConnect is uh, designed to allow government bodies at all levels, so local, state and federal, to manage compensation claims at an excellent service standard. So the work communication solution is designed to improve return to work outcomes and our integrated data and analytics tools can assist government agencies in ensuring they remain compliant with the relevant compensation schemes. Um, these are just some of the uh, software solutions and tools that uh, Insurance and Compensation uh, Services is working on. Uh, and we'll send out some more information in our follow-up email after the seminar if there's anything or any further interest. So with that, I might pass back over to Mark. Thanks, Locke. Excellent. It uh, is awesome work that you guys have done. And of course, MAG uses the software that um, ICS has developed uh, in its workflow uh, management bookings and payments for uh, the range of services that we provide to the industry. Um, so Mark, thank you again uh, for your time today in your presentation on shoulder pathology. Um, it, the subject line is certainly not something that um, is going to cause controversy, but I'm sure we can um, ask you some tricky questions to see uh, whether we can elicit some interest um, some, some broader interest. So thanks again for your time. If you could just uh, give us a little bit of background about yourself um, and how you got to where we are today. Um, nothing too personal, you know, because um, I've sorted out all your, your sports issues. Um, the, the rest is, is over to you. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Mark? Yep. All good. Okay. And should I put up the um, yep. uh, sure. PowerPoint? Thank you. Is that okay? Is that coming through all right to you? Not yet. No. Um, so down the bottom, little green button, share screen, and then click on your PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Well, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've been in practice for over 30 years. That's um, not just yet. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, I've got the share screen. And I'll just... There we go. How's that? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Make it large right. on your screen. Yes. I'll just uh, put in presentation uh, mode. There we go. Is that going well? Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm 30 years. I've had um, extensive experience in uh, shoulder surgery um, starting in the early 90s when I trained in England and then further training in the in um, in America uh, at Harvard, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospitals. Um, so the talk today is about uh, evaluation of the shoulder and common shoulder conditions. And uh, if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to indicate somehow and we can stop midway and I can elucidate them or um, give you a bit more color and background on it. So, Shoulder pain, uh, as you know, is very common uh, in the primary care setting. And it's responsible for many musculoskeletal complaints. So essentially when the, I know there's a variety of people I'm talking to today, but essentially the key for most medical conditions is uh, looking at the age of the patient, uh, knowing where the pain is and tailoring the physical examination. You can narrow the uh, causes of the condition down to a handful. Um, essentially, you make the point that uh, patients often will point to uh, where they think uh, the pain is. And um, it's often quite uh, elucidating. Uh, it's quite clear with, uh, say, uh, AC joint, the cromacovicular joint, they will point directly on the joint. Whereas um, sometimes when they start pointing down the arm, this will be referred pain 
on the shoulder or from the neck. Um, often shoulder conditions are treated non-operatively with physiotherapy, medication, and local anaesthetic injection. So essentially looking at the shoulder, I don't know if you can see my pointer here at all on the screen, but um, we've got uh, the scapula, uh, which is the, the bone that sits on the back of the uh, thoracic um, cage and rotates around the, the thoracic cage with shoulder movement. Uh, the glenohumeral joint is the joint between the humerus, this bone here, and the glenoid surface on the scapula. Uh, it has two tuberosities. There, there's a special um, extension of the scapula, uh, the scapular spine on the back of the shoulder here, which goes into the acromion. And then there's the clavicle, which is the collarbone. Um, filling out and fleshing out, looking from the front, uh, the coracoid process is this little beak part over the front of the shoulder. And this is a useful landmark when looking at x-rays and CAT scans. We know the coracoid process is an anterior structure and underneath the, the coracoid runs the subscapularis muscle. Above it runs the supraspinatus muscle. And they come to insert onto the tuberosities of the shoulder. I shouldn't have gone forward. Um, the other thing of note in this picture is uh, the, long, the bicep tendon, which runs stylized uh, here and then goes through a 90 degree curve down into the um, bicepital sheath and then into the arm here. And so the bicep tendon is quite an important uh, stabilizer of the shoulder running between subscapularis and supraspinatus tendons. Um, and it can be involved in pathology, especially around the labrum of the shoulder. And we'll come to that. So here we are here. This is the biceps tendon coming across and it is continuous with the labrum of the shoulder. This labrum is a reinforcing ring, the consistency of pencil eraser, which reinforces the glenoid. Uh, it provides, the glenoid is quite flat and it provides stability and capture for the more rounded and spherical humeral head. Uh, that's the key picture in the lateral view that I want you to take notice of. This is the coracoid process down here, so we're anterior. This is the acromium here. Between them is the coracoacromial ligament, which can cause compression over the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, next one. Posterior aspect of the shoulder, uh, these are the short uh, muscles to the uh, scapula. And the, these are important in uh, rehabilitation of the shoulder. And uh, particularly because they stabilize the scapula. Often some shoulder problems are, can be exacerbated by poor posture. And these uh, short scapular muscles, if they're strong, and the focus of the physiotherapy is to strengthen them and make them strong so that the scapula is then retracted back onto the thoracic wall, giving stability to the shoulder. So when we look, we're trying to work out the causes of pain uh, in a shoulder, uh, we look at um, articular causes and causes due to the joint problems and causes uh, periarticular causes, which are usually tenderness problems, but causes not specific to uh, uh, articular uh, joints. So, um, I think we'll skip on for a minute. So these are the all important uh, points that we look at at the history. Age, related, uh, age is very important because recurrent, um, certain conditions affect certain ages more. For instance, rotator cuff injury is rare under 30 or 40, whereas instability problems are common under 30 or 40. Um, long head of bicep problems, um, are more of a problem in the younger 30 to 40 age group patient. And as they become older, these become more of a degenerative problem and less likely to be the pain generator. So age is important 
need to know the hand dominance occupation, what sports people play, and uh, the onset of the condition. Obviously, acute injuries um, and acute conditions in medicine and surgery are generally more easily treated than chronic injuries. Uh, night pain is a key feature for most orthopedic conditions. Uh, night pain generally indicates uh, that someone will need um, uh, more extensive treatment. Uh, so it's important to also to assess uh, the weakness of uh, muscle muscles around the shoulder and the restriction of the range of movement. This is especially important in um, third party assessment for impairment. So physical examination, this is looking from behind and you look for um, essentially the basic principles that will look at the skin, the shape and the position. And uh, you can see this um, winging of the scapula due to um, this abnormal look of the scapula uh, due to um, palsy of the uh, uh, long thoracic nerve of Bell. And we look for muscle atrophy, wasting of the muscle uh, and deformity. Uh, so range of motion, we look at, this is important for um, assessment in uh, uh, WPI. So we look at uh, flexion extension here, if you can see that, uh, and abduction and adduction. And then rotation is generally measured for assessment with the arm in uh, at 90 degrees of abduction rather than measured down here. Um, rotator cuff muscles, we've um, touched on these briefly. Looking from the front again, the coracoid process underneath is subscapularis. Quite a big muscle extending from the whole of the inferior surface adjacent to the thoracic cage of the uh, scapula. It's a strong internal rotator of the uh, shoulder and is in the anterior part of the shoulder providing. This is what go, you go through to get into the front of the shoulder from the anterior approach. Above that is the supraspinatus muscle, which is a prime stabilizer of the shoulder and uh, is used in abduction, that is to bring the out, arm out, out from the side. Infraspinatus is at the posterior aspect of the shoulder here, and it is a strong uh, external rotator of the shoulder. Uh, Randy two is quite a large muscle. So when we examine somebody, we feel uh, generally you feel the skin first, uh, then the soft tissue for heat. Um, and then we look at the joints, uh, the AC joint, uh, sternoclavicular joint to a lesser degree. These are rarely a problem. And glenohumeral joint. Uh, examine the bicep tendon, look at the coracoid process, the chromium and the scapula. So then we have uh, certain tests uh, for the shoulder and these will be referred to in reports. And these are this drop arm, empty cam, push off. This is, uh, physios talk a lot about this one. And what this is reflecting is um, impingement tests uh, where the aim is to abut the head of the humerus and the tuberosity against the acromion uh, to cause pain. And uh, Nears test was originally lifting the arm straight up in the air uh, with the arm in internal rotation. And then that would cause pain. That was a positive sign. And then the Hawkins test is to internally rotate the shoulder, take it across the body, and that would reproduce the, across the body in AD duction going this way, and that would reproduce uh, the pain in the shoulder. There are other tests, speeds tests for the biceps tendon, and that involves, if you can see the picture here, is lifting the arm up straight. That's the first part of the test. The second part is uh, if he then tries to elevate the arm here against your hand, and that will give a positive test. Jorgensen's test is a test for the biceps tendon as it runs through the, um, under the transverse ligament between the two tuberosities in the proximal humerus. And that is a forced ex a supination of the forearm. 
uh, it's less common. These tests are um, quite specific for the biceps, but they don't necessarily tell you the cause of the pain. AC joint is generally found to be painful by uh, local examination, and then bringing the arm across the body will cause there to be pain. The AC joint can also hurt uh, in a forward elevation where there is a high painful arc as contradistinction to a lower painful arc for subscapularis pain and impeachment. Looking at other special tests, the sulcus sign. These are um, signs for uh, instability of the shoulder, uh, generally multi-directional. If you um, pull down uh, in the line of the humerus, you'll get a little indentation or a vacuum effect uh, indicating uh, inferior instability of the shoulder. Uh, apprehension signs are caused when the shoulder is put into a position where you test uh, anterior or posterior parts of the capsule to look at um, how mobile they are, how stable the shoulder is being kept and whether the shoulder can be relocated easily and how far you can move it. And the loaded shift is a further uh, test of that uh, instability. So we look at um, O'Brien's test. You can see here in this test, the arms in abduction, external rotation, and he's trying to um, give, uh, make, the, make the arm feel unstable to see if he has air, um, a condition of anterior instability. Uh, the O'Brien's test is generally holding the elbow with, with your hand and manipulating the shoulder around stretching and testing the posterior and anterior labrum of the shoulder. So if anybody's got any questions, it's probably a good time to ask about the anatomy, if um, you can hear me or, or not. Um, so moving on to uh, specific examples. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, conditions about the shoulder, uh, we could look at uh, rotator cuff pathology. This is um, more common uh, as people age. In fact, we know that uh, as people age, uh, there will be uh, a percentage of people who die with torn rotator cuffs who do not have any symptoms. Uh, However, rotator cuff pathology can occur uh, acutely uh, where uh, there is a fall on the outstretched hand or a fall onto the point of the shoulder causing pain and weakness in the shoulder. It's important to distinguish between acute traumatic and chronic degenerative uh, pathology because the, the treatment and prognosis for both are different. So essentially, uh, you will find that there will be uh, pain with the range of movement. They'll have less range of movement. They may be tender over the cuff insertion. Uh, the impingement sign and Hawkins nears and Hawkins tests will be uh, positive. And uh, there'll be weakness of power of internal external rotation or um, abduction of the shoulder. Uh, essentially, uh, when we talk about rotator cuff, uh, pathology. It, it, the rotator cuff is uh, is the four muscles of of um, subscapularis, infraspinatus, and supraspinatus. Um, the words are used uh, synonymously. So, rotator cuff pathology. Uh, an X-ray uh, can often is can can be negative, but sometimes you can see areas of sclerosis in the greater tuberosity, which would indicate uh, impingement. And X-ray may also show calcification in the tendon. Um, ultrasound is commonly used because it's cheap and available. Uh, it's um, less reliable. And uh, I usually don't like putting a lot of weight in, a in, in, a, in the diagnosis made from ultrasound. If there's continuing problems, failure to respond to non-operative treatment, uh, an MRI should be considered. 
If, however, there is an acute tear and the patient can't lift his shoulder, uh, there's no point delaying uh, the MRI. So management uh, for tendinopathy and impingement involves uh, non-operative treatment, physiotherapy, and uh, subacromial injections. Uh, this can also be for uh, partial thickness tear, you'd have physiotherapy and a subacromial injection. But with a full thickness acute tear, uh, orthopedic referral is generally recommended. So, frozen shoulder. This is a not uncommon condition. Um, it, it, it uh, runs a well-defined pathological process. We really don't know what causes it other than it can come on after minimal trauma, just a little jolt on the arm, may stir it up, and there appears to be some autoimmune uh, relations. So adhesive capsulitis is um, where the capsule of the shoulder joint, this area here, becomes constricted and there is severe restriction of movement of the shoulder and pain. And the pain uh, can be quite extreme and uh, you know, completely debilitating. It is um, usually not related to a significant injury, just a minor, mi very minor injury. And uh, it can occur in well, it says here less than 40, but it's generally a bit older than that. There are some risk factors with uh, diabetes and hypothyroidism. So the physical examination uh, generally reveals that there's global restriction of uh, movement and um, external rotation is often uh, much less than 50%. And um, there is um, a firm endpoint with passive ranges of motion of the shoulder. Uh, in general, if you have a, an older patient, which what could be considered frozen shoulder, you would have to think there is other pathology in the shoulder, such as arthritis. You'd, you'd have to rule that out. So um, diagnosis is generally clinical. You may need an x-ray to rule out a fracture or osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint and uh, consideration for an MRI later if there's rotator cuff pathology. In general, the, um, the treatment for this is intraarticular glucocorticoid injections done by the radiologists and uh, physiotherapy. Often the physiotherapy can be quite painful. So they need to be, um, uh, the physiotherapists need to be held back a bit. Um, physiotherapy, I think generally uh, is like a cheer squad and they uh, help with the patients uh, getting better. Uh, essentially, the natural history for this condition is quite good. Um, there's generally, they describe, uh, classically described as um, three periods of approximately six months. The first period is the freezing period where the shoulder is stiff and painful. The second period of six months is where the pain has decreased but the shoulder remains stiff. And then there is the thawing period, the last three months, where the uh, range of movement starts to improve. Sometimes patients will be uh, will have a manipulation between the first and second periods when the pain has gone and there is left with residual stiffness and patients don't like that. So glenohumeral joint instability. Uh, this is one of the few conditions where the initial age of presentation uh, has a worse prognostic factor uh, is, has a worse prognosis than a later age of presentation. For instance, people who have dislocation of the shoulder under the age of 20 are 80% likely to re-dislocate their shoulder if they continue with that sporting activity. Whereas older patients, if they dislocate their shoulder after the age of 40, then the chances of them re-dislocating are quite low. So, Shoulder glenohumeral joint dislocation often occurs at sport, can occur in the work situation. If somebody was carrying something above shoulder level and the arm went backwards uh, with weight, 
uh, the shoulder could quite easily dislocate. But in general, it's a forceful abduction external rotation injury. So essentially, acutely, if there's a dislocation, it has to be reduced either by paramedics or doctors at the hospital. But sometimes you can have um, a partial dislocation or a subluxation, and that will tend to go back in by itself. Uh, there, there can be transient pins and needles uh, down in the upper arm. And uh, the physical exams, uh, if you were having a, if you found a sulcus sign quite early, one would have to be uh, concerned there was uh, ligamentous laxity and uh, possible, this could be a presentation of a multi-directional instability and uh, which is more likely, which is less likely to be traumatic. So that needs to be taken uh, account of. So diagnosis is uh, clinical and the x-rays are generally normal. If there is a glenohumeral joint instability and the x-rays are abnormal, uh, this requires further imaging such as a CAT scan or MRI. And what that means generally is if the x-rays are abnormal, there will be a problem with a, a bone fracture uh, on the uh, glenoid surface or a bone fracture on the humeral head. This carries with it a worse prognosis and hence further investigation is um, required earlier to perhaps consider early intervention. Um, MRI arthrocrine uh, may be necessary if people don't make improvement. So with glenohumeral joint instability, you can give up the sport, you can focus on uh, physiotherapy treatment, uh, and if you keep having recurrent dislocations, then you need referral to a big surgeon. So with acute shoulder dislocation, this is the more common uh, shoulder dislocation where the humeral head comes out of the front of the shoulder and uh, it can take with it um, the glenoid labrum and also some bone at the bottom of the glenoid. Uh, one has to check that there's no numbness over the axillary nerve distribution over the lateral aspect of the arm before relocation is performed. And um, the shoulder's relocated in whatever method uh, the paramedics and the doctors do. And then um, they start exercises straight away. So dislocation, uh, AC joint. This uh, can be with a direct fall on the point of the shoulder, which is more common, or um, direct uh, that's a direct blow or a fall on the outstretched arms. Um, it's quite an obvious uh, lesion. Uh, there's often a, a large step where you can see the outer end of the clavicle under the skin. Uh, it's not very hard to make this diagnosis. The patient is tender over the AC joint, there is swelling. Uh, there is a typical history of injury. Um, so they're the gradings of um, AC joint separation. In general, in orthopedics, um, grade one is mild, grade two is moderate, grade three severe, but AC joint seems to have its own special um, six grades. Um, and in general, if the, um, two, if the two ends of the bones are, are touching, then generally, uh, the prognosis is very good. If, however, in the uh, type five, where the uh, clavicle is protruded up through the muscle belly, uh, this is best treated by bringing it down and holding it down to the coracoid process uh, and immobilise and keeping it there uh, for approximately six weeks. Um, that's fairly straightforward surgery usually. Shoulder arthritis. Uh, is um, quite common uh, in the elderly. Uh, of course, it's rare in the worker um, under the age of 50, and it generally presents with um, increasing pain with decreasing movement, trouble sleeping on the shoulder at night. Pain is usually felt down the outer aspect of the arm, and um, it's the restriction of external rotation, which is really gives you the most indication that the shoulder's not working properly. Um, you can get all these other impingement syndromes um, and weakness, 
But uh, this is why we generally do an X-ray in people over 60, just to make sure that they're not getting arthritis of the shoulder. So it's generally a clinical diagnosis, as you can see on the X-ray, this decreased joint space, indicating there's uh, wear of the, of the cartilage over the outer end of the bone. The cartilage is radiolucent. That means you can't see it, uh, whereas bone, of course, is radiodense. You can see the bone. The management for shoulder arthritis is with all uh, arthritic conditions, uh, behaviour modification, Panadol, anti-inflammatory medications, and sometimes a cortisone injection. Uh, we tend not to use too much of the glucose um, of the glucosamine and chondroitins. And the um, treatment for shoulder arthritis, if, if not approved treatment fails, is shoulder replacement. Uh, label tear. So this is what um, we diagnose if you see um, uh, the O'Brien's test or the Jurgensen's test. And uh, the labrum, uh, the labrum uh, is connected to the biceps tendon, the superior part. And the SLAP is really is uh, an acronym for superior labrum from anterior to posterior. And as you can see on the picture on the right, there's the labrum here, which is detached from the anterior aspect of the glenoid. And uh, it continues up into the biceps tendon. And this is the slab tear. Um, and it's generally as a result of trauma um, or um, similar to that of a dislocation. And uh, generally you will find that the biceps provocation tests uh, will be positive with a labral tear. And the best way of uh, treating a labral tear is um, with an MRI. Uh, X-rays will show a hill sex lesion when there has been a dislocation of the shoulder. In general, management treatment for a labral tear is uh, rest, behavior modification, and then physiotherapy. Uh, and repair is indicated uh, an orthopedic referral if there is night pain or continuing instability or problems uh, performing activities of daily living. The six scapulas, the final thing, this is uh, generally related to poor scapular conditioning. Um, it comes on after repetitive overhead activity and the patient complains of a drooping shoulder and pain. Um, so the sick means that the scapula is malpositioned there is inferior medial border prominence, there's coracoid pain and malposition, and there is abnormal kinesis of the scapula. It generally refers to physiotherapy treatment, working on strengthening these muscles at the back of the shoulder. As a routine, starting off with physiotherapy to work on general strengthening about the shoulder girdle is what we normally do for most uh, shoulder conditions. So take home points is um, a frozen shoulder is really a clinical diagnosis. Um, if you're concerned about a labral tear, you really need an MR or MR arthrogram. Most chronic shoulder pain can be treated conservatively. And uh, if the patient's not improving clinically, they should be referred. So um, I think that's it. I'll just leave it there. Back to you, mate. Thanks, Mark. Um, now I know why my left shoulder, which is uh, has a impact injury from uh, rugby, feels very different in its pathology to the right shoulder, which is a wear and tear sort of injury. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> the, the treatment's the same though just ignore it and hope it goes away no, in general most things are until <laughs> you have night pain or restriction of your activities of daily living um, or you just can't uh, manage you know that's well, I've got chronic night pain for sure yeah that's what I find that's what drives most people to surgery they can't, most people have surgery when they can't sleep on it at night 
Yeah, that's most of the other time they can get by with painkillers and they just put up with it. Yeah, I'm on to the two Panadol before I go to bed, and that usually gets me through till about five or six o'clock in the morning. Well, you're coping with it. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Um, questions now. I didn't quite understand the uh, question from Alicia, if you're able to respond to that at all. Mark. Or if um, Alicia I, wants to uh, verbalise that, um, unmute yourself and and uh, ask the question. Can you read that, Mark? No, I can't read anything. Sorry. I can't see what, I can't see what you... I can see you. I can't see the question. How would okay. I get to it? Uh, in the chat, down the bottom. Oh, okay, got it. Okay, um, Alicia. Okay, that's not a Peter Hammer. I don't know what uh, that is, other than what you've written. Um, that may be re referring to the piso hamate, the you know the pisiform bone but I, I can't give you that. Okay. Uh, from Brian Burgess to everyone. Yep. What is the condition where the shoulder is frozen, but by inserting a needle and sucking out the material inside, movement can be restored? There is a condition called calcific tendonitis, where there can be acute uh, calcium deposits in the supraspinatus tendon, and the patients will often present with, uh, or the patients will present with severe shoulder pain, and um, if you and the needle can be put inside the calcific de deposit in the supraspinatus tendon, and the calcific material can be sucked out, and then that can help the pain. It's not common, uh, but it is one condition uh, which can be helped with a, any injection where it sucks stuff out. Other than that, I don't know of any other conditions where you can insert a needle and suck out the material. Mark, it's Barry Gilbert here. Um, am I able to ask a question, Mark Gibbons? Is that okay? Good, thanks. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, workers' compensation often gets its knickers in a knot about adhesive capsulitis, particularly the most important factors, and uh, whether it's minor trauma or someone who presents with diabetes, for example, whether it's stable or unstable, um, how relatively important would you rate those sorts of conditions rather than maybe or possibly a minor injury, which is very difficult to yeah. quantify? Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I, I don't see a lot of people that have diabetes causing their adhesive capsulitis. It just seems to be uh, mentioned the whole time throughout all the literature that diabetes is related to it. But I don't think there's a lot to support it. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's one of these things that might happen at work, unfortunately, and it's not necessarily work that does it, but it's just that's when it happened. And uh, people don't have it. And then, people don't um, get it just because they've got diabetes either. They get it because there's usually a trauma. Right. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it is difficult. Yeah, idiopathic is significant. I think so. I think it's the um, most. You'd know yeah. that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Certainly. Thank yeah, you. I think it's. I think the the um, the other conditions are rarely involved. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Mark. Um, any any other questions? Um, if this is to be the closing, and we're certainly open for a few more minutes to take some more questions, uh, just wanted to thank you again, Mark, for your time to put this together. Um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's always um, very, very helpful and great to, uh, to have your contribution. Um, we will distribute the presentation to everyone who has registered with your permission. Um, of course. And thank you. Uh, and I'm sure that um, uh, we'll have a few more post presentation questions when people have a little bit of time to think about uh, all the information, which is um, qu quite, quite significant. Um, 
Any other they, questions? They could send it through as an email or something. Pardon, Mark? They could send it through as an email? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. You know, if they wanted that. Yep. And uh, I'm sure you, um, we're all looking forward to being get, being able to get back out on the uh, international conference um, uh, circuit over the next um, 12 months again. Uh, yeah, that'd be lovely. You're, you're, a, you're a great participant in the conferences, aren't you, Mark? Oh, I do my share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's important to support the industry. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, look, I just had a general question. Um, if there are any yeah. other doctors uh, uh, here today, um, I've had a few inquiries from uh, law firms in the States recently. Um, and uh, has anyone ever registered or be had anything to do with the ABIME and the uh, Comcare accreditations that they did some time ago? I know Barry has. Um, does anybody else have any understanding of uh, conducting medical legal reports in uh, US jurisdictions? No. Okay, I just thought I'd ask. Okay. Um, because we have had some inquiries. Uh, our software was launched there only a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, plaintiff law firms are using it and they've started to see what it is that we, we do over here. And they've asked uh, for a few of our specialists. One is in the MTBI space. Um, and uh, that, that's very um, topical at the moment in the States. Uh, in minor concussions and traumas from motor vehicle accidents and how the long-term impacts of that um, are unknown at the point of uh, injury. So there's there's quite a, uh, a wealth of um, experiences coming out of that. And then off the back of that, um, there's we've had some inquiries, but uh, just something for future discussion. All right, look, Mark, I think we'll wrap it up then. Um, no further... Uh, questions, um, lots of thank yous coming through um, and requests for the presentation, which we will do, no doubt. So um, let's uh, wrap it up and uh, look forward to getting out in the tennis court with you again. <laughs> well, not okay. again, but next time, Mark. Yep. Thanks, Mark. That'd be great. All right, mate. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.